a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a bag of bones. And just when I ran. in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burden and bitterness You can just keep it moving No, you ain't welcome here From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you save my soul This wayward son is found Because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free, I'm not the same, I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God. Because you heal my heart, you change 
should not be dependent on how you feel. Yes. Your worship is dependent on who God is. Yes. And He's the greatest thing in the universe. He's the greatest one. He created us all, and He loved us enough to send Jesus. So no matter what life throws at us, we should say, yes, I will. Lift Him high. Let's worship together.
your hands and worship right now. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We adore you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy of our praise. We magnify you today. Bless you today. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 He's worthy of our praise tonight. Amen. 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 Sing it one more time, Chris. You may be seated. So good to see you tonight. The house of the Lord, number of places you could have been, but you chose to be here. And we're glad that you did. Amen. Amen. Don't make me come out there. <laughs> David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Why did he say that? Because he came with an expectation to meet the Lord there. If I know I'm going to meet the Lord somewhere, I want to go. And I'm glad that you're here tonight. And just thank you for being here. I want to encourage you again tonight, as I did this morning, that you would make a special effort tonight to give for our evangelist, uh, evangelist Cliff West. My good friend. I consider him a very good friend and brother in the Lord. And just so thankful that in our coming here, it wasn't long after we came here that we got to know Cliff. In fact, we had been here probably about two months, and Pastor May had brought Cliff in for a revival, and um, that's our first invi uh, you know, invitation to getting to know him, and we got to know him, and I can remember Cliff, I was standing somewhere over about here, Angela and I was, were, and our house was on the market in North Carolina, had not yet sold, and had been on the market since June, and now it was October, we were living with Pastor and with Marion at the time. And um, I remember we had had several showings of our house, had had several open houses and no offers in four or five months, no offers. And I can remember standing over here, I think it was Wednesday night of the revival, you prayed over us and you asked the Lord to accelerate the process. Two days later, we had an offer on our house. It was under contract. It was a few days after that, the house closed. It was sold. And by, what was so, so crazy about it is the people who bought it were from Norfolk. Isn't that funny? We moved here and they moved there. Our neighbors back there have never forgiven us for that. <laughs> they no longer live there. But I thank the Lord uh, that he came through for us. But I thank the Lord for you, brother, and many, many times through the years you've spoken to this church. Amen? Amen. So I want to encourage you tonight that you give. The gift box is there. 
on that center camera stand. I've already placed my offering back there, but if you came prepared to give, you can give as you go out. If you did not come, but you'd like to give online, you can give online, and there's a QR code up there you can scan and give and give to the man of God. Amen? Lord, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for our church. Lord, I thank you for our evangelist, my friend, my brother in the Lord. I trust his ministry. I trust him as a man of God. I'm grateful for your calling upon him. And I pray, Lord, that you will just move upon him again tonight to speak to us yet again and to challenge us and to encourage us with the word that you've given him. We're grateful, and we're grateful for the opportunity that we have to partner together with him to sow into his ministry, Lord, that he can go other places and can support his family. We thank you, Lord, today for Cliff. Thank you for his family. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and amen.
know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Somebody say Jesus, 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 Jesus. Say his name three or four times. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, close your eyes and say his name again, Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, at the name of Jesus, demons flee, at the name of Jesus, angels bow, at the name of Jesus, sicknesses are healed. At the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Clap your hands and celebrate with me. The name of Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. I like what our evening speaker said at our prayer conference back in February up in Charlottesville. The praise team had sung this same song. And when he walked up to the podium, he said, I don't speak Hebrew or Greek, or Russian, or Chinese, and he named some other languages, and he says, but I do speak Jesus. <laughs> I do speak Jesus. And I speak Jesus over my tomorrow, and I speak Jesus over next week, and I speak Jesus over my wife and over my children. And there is power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You could speak any other name and not get the same result. But in the name of Jesus, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, Pastor Chris and praise team for leading us into the presence of the Lord. And your worship is not only skillful, but anointed and passionate. And uh, it is doing just exactly what it was designed to do and usher us right into the very presence of the Lord. Let me say thanks again to... My friend and your pastor, Dr. Rodney Vickers, it is a joy to be your friend. The more time I spend with you, the better off I am. I learn so much from you. You are uh, just a, a, a leader par excellence. And, uh, and I just enjoy the time I spend not only in church with you, but uh, on a personal level. And I even like your dog. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that makes me a good guy. Uh, but thank you for inviting me to your church again for today. And, uh, and I always enjoy our time together. I'm excited to share the message for this evening. Just remain seated, if you will, for the reading of God's Word. We're going to display 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Which reads, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also who love his appearing. And the title that I want to use for this evening is the phrase, Get a Grip. Now, you got to smile when you do this, but look at somebody beside you and say, you need to get a grip. Just tell somebody, you need to get a grip. Get a grip. Let us pray. Father, thank you for another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. We are thankful for the health to be here. We are thankful for the opportunity to be here. We're thankful that your presence is here. Now, teach us of your word. May we abide in your word and your word abide in us. Let the entrance of your word bring light and life and understanding to us. And among other things, help us tonight to be determined to serve the Lord greater than ever before. We ask it in his holy name. And everyone says amen. 
I brought this with me tonight. I want it to represent the type of baton that is used in a relay race. And I want to call it the baton of faith with the idea when I say to get a grip, I'm talking about getting a grip and holding on by faith. I ran for the track team when I was in high school. They've changed the wording now, but back in the day, the event that I ran was called the 880, which is two laps around a quarter mile track. So I ran the event that was the half mile race. Now, I'll just be honest with you. I never came in first place in any of the races that I ran. I did come in fourth place one day, but there were only four of us running that day, so I don't know if that qualifies. I was not on the relay team. The four fastest guys on the track team were a part of the relay team. And one day at track practice, I overheard the coach teaching the relay team the proper way to hand the baton from one runner to the next during the relay race. There is a part of the track that is known as the transitioning area of the track, and that's where the handoff takes place. And for starters, the person that is to receive the baton does not stand stationary waiting to receive the baton. And that part of the track, it is allowed, and to your advantage, the one with the baton and the one to receive the baton are both running in the transitioning area of the track. He told them it would be a mistake for the one to receive the baton to look back with his hand out open this way as he's running to receive the baton. You will lose precious seconds and probably lose the race. The proper way, he said, was to face the goal and to turn your hand behind this way with an open hand and just wait for the feeling of the baton. It is really the responsibility of the first runner to firmly place the baton into the hand of the second runner. And it's the responsibility of the second runner. You get the idea to place it into the hand of the third runner and so forth. And then let me mention that the fourth runner of, of a relay race is often referred to as the anchor man. And I graduated from Hopewell High School, which is south of Richmond, and the anchor man for our team was Alfonso Harris, and he was as fast as greased lightning, as we say. And at times when we were lagging in the relay race, I didn't worry because I knew if they could just put that baton into the hands of Alfonso Harris, we would be okay, and I saw him win many races. I'm saying that to say this. That the baton of faith has been passed down from generation to generation. It is our responsibility to firmly place this faith into the hands of the next generation, the younger generation. And might I add, if we are the generation alive on planet earth when Christ returns, then that means that we would be the anchor generation, the anchor man generation. Now that's pretty impressive. That's encouraging to think that God designed for you to be alive and well on planet earth as a part of the Anchorman generation. And I'm here to declare we have a task before us. We have a mission before us. So get a grip and get busy doing what God has called you to do. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And amen. With that in mind, I want us really to look at three responsibilities of the believer in regard to the baton of faith. And let's look at point number one right now. And I suggest that we need to run with the faith. I read earlier from chapter 4, but now let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 at verse 5 and 6 when Paul says to his son Timothy in the faith, I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. 
It's easy to look at this verse and see this idea of a, of a relay race with the faith, the baton of faith being passed from one generation to another. It's as though Paul is saying to Timothy, I know your mama and I know your grandmama. And they were both godly women. And your grandmother was a faithful woman of God and she lived for God and she did what God called her to do and passed it off to the next generation. And Timothy, I know your mother. And she was a praying woman and she was a godly woman and, and she, lived, she ran her race and she ran her lap. But Timothy, now the baton is in your hand. So it is your turn to run with it. The former generations have gone on. They've lived their life. They're in the grave. Their soul is in heaven. But now it is our lot. Now it is our responsibility. The baton is in our hand. How foolish would it be of me if I were in a relay race at Hopewell High School and they put the baton in my hand but instead of running, I was waving at my friends up in the stands or I was checking something on Facebook. You can see how ridiculous that would be. Now, you may do those things if you don't have the baton. But once you receive the baton of faith, then you are responsible to run with it. And friends, I declare to you that we, the current generation, need to, as Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift of God which is in you. Now that it's our turn, we need to get stirred up about it. The Greek word here that is used for stir up the gift really means to fan into a flame. So fan into a flame. Get passionate about what the Lord has called you to do. What does this passion look like? Let me use Reinhard Bonnke as an example. He passed away a year or so ago, a great man of faith a German man that spent most of his time in Africa, missionary work. In the early 1970s, he was not yet preaching to the massive crowds, but he would go to local churches. And on this particular occasion, he said in the church he was preaching to 200 people, but they were all old people. He said to the pastor, you have 200 people, but they are all old people. He says, where are all the young people? And after service, the pastor said, I will show you. This is in the 1970s. The disco was very popular. He drove him across town, parked outside the disco, and pointed at the building. And he said, all the young people are in there. And Bonky says, how can we get them out of there and get them into the church? And the pastor says, well, I don't know how we're going to do that. And while they're standing there in the parking lot, the Holy Spirit spoke to Reinhard Bonky to go into the disco. And he says to the pastor, I'm going in there to see what's going on. And the pastor says, I'm not going in there. <laughs> and the bonky says, I'm going. The Holy Spirit told me to go in there. And he went in there and he said, yes, there was a lot of music and there was a lot of dancing. He says, but when I looked in their eyes, I saw an emptiness. I saw they were not fulfilled. They were looking for something, some joy. And he said, I knew I had what they needed. So he spoke to the manager and he said, I'm Reinhard Bonnke from Germany. I'm in Africa for a week or 10 days or so. I want to preach to the young people in this disco. And the guy laughed. He says, you're never going to preach in this disco. And he says, well, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me that I'm to preach. And after a conversation, the manager finally said, if you'll come back tomorrow night at midnight, I will give you five minutes. So the next evening, Bonky went to the local church and preached to 200 old people. And I love this part of his testimony. He said, after church, he changed out of his preacher clothes and dressed for the disco. I would love to see Bonky dressed for the disco. I would pay money to see that picture. <laughs> Bonky went into the disco, went into the disco, and at midnight, the manager gave him a microphone and says, now remember, you only have five minutes. He asked them to be seated, and that's when he realized there were no seats in the place, and they all sat on the floor. He preached a gospel message for three minutes and gave a two-minute altar invitation, and at the end of a five-minute gospel presentation, he said, if you want Jesus in your life, raise your hand. And every young person in the place raised their hand. Clap your hands. We ought to give God some glory and praise for that. One year later, Balki came to, from, from Germany back to Africa. The pastor met him at the airport. Instead of taking him to the church, he took him to the disco. 
because the disco by this time was out of business and the disco building had become the church building. And he pulled up at the disco, the old disco, and it was the church and there was a cross hanging on the, on the wall and hanging on the door. And when he walked in, all those same young people were there a year later and they started shouting, Barky, Barky, Barky. He says, no, it's not about me. Shout Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What does a passion look like? What does it mean to run with the faith, to get excited about your ministry? Sometimes we have to take risk. Sometimes we have to speak to people in places outside of the church. If we're going to run with this faith in this last day, they're not all going to come in here. So we have to go out there where they are and run with the faith. I don't want to get too lengthy in my preaching, but I'll share with you what happened a number of years ago. I was traveling home late at night. It was past midnight. I was hungry. There are not many choices at that hour of the night. Waffle House stays open 24 hours a day. I was the only customer. I sat in the corner. The lady that was the waitress answered the phone. She was cussing and she was fussing. She was mad. She was livid. She slammed that phone down and starts telling the cook all this mess that's going on. I overheard all of it. Well, by this time I was finished eating my meal. It was time to pay the bill and leave. But I felt a compulsion to speak to this lady. And I didn't know how that was going to happen. And the only plan I came up with was order some more food. (laughs) I wasn't hungry, but I ordered a second sandwich. And I kept thinking, Lord, how am I going to speak to this lady? Let me tell you what the Lord did. When she finished washing a few dishes, she came over there, the booth where I was, sat down right across from me and dropped her chin on the back of her hand and looked me right in the eye. And I thought, well, I guess this is my opportunity now. She's sitting right here in the booth with me. I says, ma'am, I heard part of the conversation on the phone. It sounds like you're really going through a lot of trouble. She said, you don't know the half of it. And she took about 15 or 20 minutes and told me about the mess going on in her home and in her family. And her husband was in prison and her son had just got out of prison. He was living with her and robbing her blind. She was working two, three jobs trying to make ends meet and got a bad doctor's report and everything was wrong. I said, I think I can help you. She said, how can you help me? I said, it's all about a man named Jesus. And she sat there long enough for me to explain the gospel salvation plan and prayed with me and then escorted me out the door into my car. They don't usually escort you at a Waffle House, do they? But she escorted me out the door and to my car and God made a change in that woman's life. She may never come to a meeting to hear me preach, but we've got to run with the faith wherever they are and share this gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody shout, run with the faith. Run with the faith. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, the scripture says, do with all your might. Let's look at the second responsibility of a believer. Point number two now on the next slide. And that is hold on to the faith. We're referring to this baton of faith. Hold on. In the same chapter, one of 2 Timothy at verse 13, the apostle Paul says, hold fast. Now, that's an archaic way of saying something. Today, we would probably say hold tightly or get a grip. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. What is he referring to when he says hold fast the pattern of sound words? He's talking about more than just a a creed of faith or as we say in the church... He's he's talking to Timothy, and I think this is important that we understand because at this time, Timothy was the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And he's dealing with all kinds of problems in the city and in the church. And the city of Ephesus at that time was wholly given to idolatry. And most of the folk in Ephesus worshipped an idol goddess by the name of Diana. And if you want to know how passionate they were, you can find in the book of Acts that on one occasion they stood out in the marketplace and for three solid hours in public shouted, Great is the goddess Diana! They were, they were passionate about worshiping their God. That was the city that Timothy pastored in. And then in his church in Ephesus, there was some false doctrine 
that he had to deal with. And Paul wrote him a letter as to help him to do that. In chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, The things that you have heard from me commit to faithful men who will teach others also. So Paul is telling Timothy, remember the truth that I taught to you. Get a hold of this gospel. Get a hold of these sound words and pass them along to others who will then pass them to others. And he uses an example of someone who lost the truth or dropped the baton, perhaps I could say. In Timothy, first, 2 Timothy 2 and 16, he uses Hymenius and Philetus, these two men, and according to Eugene Peterson's message paraphrase, he said they have thrown believers off stride and missed the truth by a mile, saying the resurrection is already over and done with. There were some people that were teaching some false doctrine about the resurrection, and Paul's telling Timothy, if you're going to be a successful pastor, if you're going to be a successful believer, if you're going to run this race the way you should, then you got to get a good grip on truth and get a good grip on doctrine and know what you believe and know why you believe it. I read some statistics by Barna that just startled me. He was giving the, the percentage of people in America that read the Bible, and I thought the statistics were going to say those who read the Bible every day or those that read the Bible every week. That was not the statistic. The statistic in America is how many adults read the Bible, listen, at least three or four times a year. How many adult Americans read the Bible at least three or four times a year? In 2019, 35%. 2020, when the pandemic hit, it dropped 4% to 31%. And last year, 2021, only 29% of a, a of adult Americans read the Bible even three or four times a year. The nation is struggling with things like sexual identity. And one of the speakers at the camp meeting last week said the next thing to come down the pike is going to be called species identity crisis. We're living in a messed up world. How are we going to survive? We're going to get a hold of truth. We're going to know the word of God. And we're going to live according to the word of God. Can you say amen? Somebody shout, get a grip. When Paul was talking to Timothy about understanding truth, he says it like this in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman, that's an interesting title, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. What's he talking about, a workman? Think of a person in their job. Let me just use as an example a mechanic. Let's just say for an example, I hear a knocking in my car or a noise in the engine. I don't know what's going on. I go to a mechanic, and some of these guys... They can just hear it and say, oh, I, I know what that is. You need to replace the fan belt. Oh, I, well, I can tell what that is. That's the, that's the head that's knocking. That's, a, that's probably, that sounds like you need to replace a gasket. I can tell what, and this always amazes me how a mechanic can just look over here and, and then reach into the mechanic box and grab the exact wrench, whether this is a three-eighths or one-half, and then puts it right on top and he didn't have to measure, he didn't have to look twice. He, this is a guy who just understands his work. Think about the cockpit of a jet. My wife and I flew not long ago, and as we're on our way out the jet, the door is open, and you can see inside the cockpit. I've never been inside one. I'd like to just kind of one day take a look. It looks like a thousand buttons to push. I wouldn't have a clue. But a man, a pilot, the man and woman who's flying that thing, they know, they understand. They are acquainted with the tools. My dad was a builder for 50 years. Part of the time he owned a, a backhoe that we used on the job. I had never operated the backhoe, but I needed to use it one day. And I said, it can't be that hard. can't be that difficult. And I climbed up... <laughs> I climbed up in that back hoe, and there's two or three pedals in the floor, and then there's some levers to pull over here and some levers to push over there. And I said, I'll just start pushing this stuff and see what happened. I think I, I can figure this out. No, I ended up in the ditch with that thing leaning sideways and had to go call some help to get me out of the ditch. I didn't know what I was doing. But when it comes to the Word of God, we cannot afford to be illiterate. We've got to know truth. Now, we're Pentecostals. We're a spirit-filled congregation. But let me say something. We need more than a power encounter. We need a truth encounter. 
The scripture said you shall know the truth and it's truth that makes you free. So I pray God to help us to heed the advice of Paul to Timothy and hold on to the faith. In the year 2012, in the Summer Olympics, the USA women won the gold medal. That was in 2012. Four years later, in 2016, they were predicted to win the gold medal again. I don't know if you remember or not, but in the 4x100 race in 2016, and the, as the women were running, they dropped the baton and came in last place. The lady that was to receive the, pon, the baton did exactly what she was supposed to do. She had her hand behind her. She was running forward, but it was the lady behind her who was running fast. She was doing well, but she didn't hand off correctly. And when she was about 12 inches away, she sort of tossed the baton in the air. It hit the girl in the hand. She felt it, but it fell to the ground. She had to stop. She turned around, relocated. In a relay race, you can't just run without the baton. You have to finish the race with the baton. She stopped. She picked it up. They came in last place. Paul's telling Timothy, don't drop this. Pass truth down to the next generation, and the next generation and the next generation. And I want to declare it. we need to get a grip on truth in this day with all kind of falsified things going around. We need to know what's true and what's not true. Can you say amen to that? And amen. Let's look at the third responsibility that I want to talk about on tonight. Point number three, and that is to finish with the faith. Now, I'm going to finish up here with a verse that I started with in 2 Timothy 4 and 7. Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. We believe that this letter of 2 Timothy is the last letter that, that Paul wrote, chronologically speaking, and that he was in the maritime prison in Rome. I read something. I haven't visited that prison. I would love to go to Rome one day and see that prison, but from what I read about, it was a horrible place. Basically, it was a, it was a rock hole in the ground. It had stone walls and stone floor and a stone ceiling, and they would just open an opening in the ceiling and lower them down with ropes, and they sat in the dark, no air conditioning in the summer, no heat in the winter, no bath facilities. It was horrible. And Paul is there awaiting execution. He knows they're going to take off his head. And so he's reflecting about his former Christian life, but he's also looking forward to life after death. And he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course, I've kept the faith. In the next verse, he says, now, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. I'll tell you, that's a pretty good perspective there. They're getting ready to take off his head, and he's still talking about wearing a crown. I like that kind of perspective. Amen. He says, I finished my course. Now, through the book of Acts, we know the entire race of the apostle Paul. Before he was a believer, he persecuted Christians. Then we know of his conversion, Acts chapter 9, on the way to Damascus. And we know the length of his ministry and all of those missionary travels and starting churches and pouring into the lives of others through teaching the word of God. And we know the end of his race when they took off his head. And all during that time from the Damascus Road experience to the maritime prison, he held on to the faith. He never gave up. Through all the persecution, he didn't quit. He mentioned others that did. He talked about a man named Demas who went back into the world. He talked about these other two, Hymenius and Philetus, who had given up. But Paul never did. He held on. He said, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, friends, I came to know Jesus as a young boy. I didn't always live right and do right. It was later as a teenager that I made a stronger commitment to the Lord and at the age of 16 felt my call to preach. A month later, I turned 17. Now I am 57, so I have been preaching the gospel now for 40 years. 
And so over these 40 years, I could tell you about the race that I have run. So I know the beginning of a Christian race, and I know the middle of a Christian race. What I don't know yet is the ending of a Christian race. I haven't got there yet. But whenever that happens, I don't know when I'm going to die in the 60s, when I'm in my 70s, when I'm in my 80s. I don't know the answer to that. But whenever I cross that finish line, whenever I take my last breath, whenever this heart beats the last thump, I want to have a hold of faith and a hold of truth. The scripture says lay a hold on eternal life. I don't want to die without Jesus reigning over my life. I want to finish this course with faith. And I look around the room and some of you in here are older than I am and we don't know how many more days we have. And let me just tell you flat-footed, this is no day to give up. This is no day to quit. This is no day to throw in the towel. This is no day to get lackadaisical or comatose or apathetic. This is a day, if you've ever run for Jesus, run now. We're about this close to the finish line. We can't quit now. Somebody clap your hands and exalt the name of Jesus with me. We can't quit now. We've got to press on. We're not going to give up. This old man who came to our church way up in his 90s couldn't hear, could barely see. He would come to church in a long trench coat even in hot summer months. And somebody said, you can't hear the preaching. You can't see very well. Why do you even come to church? He said, I want people to know whose side I'm on. <laughs> now is not a time to give up or quit. Finish this race with the faith. I'll close with this illustration. I was watching television a number of years ago. They interviewed this lady who was going to run the Boston Marathon. What's that? I forget. 20, how many miles is that? 26.2. You will never find me running the Boston Marathon. That's not on my bucket list. This lady was in her mid-40s and was running the Boston Marathon. They said, do you think you're going to win the race? She laughed. She says, no, I know I can't win the race. I just want to see if I can finish the race. I had no clue that I would see that lady later on in the day, but that evening I'm thumping through channels on the television. I ended up on that same network, and they said, She's about to cross the finish line, and we're going to interview this woman. I, said, I saw her interview this morning. The race had been won hours before. She was not running. She was not sprinting. She was not even walking. I would say she was staggering. This woman looked like she had used every ounce of strength. She'd take a few steps and stop. One time she turned sideways and a few folk that were still standing around says, you've got to go that way. And she staggered back around. She was just a few feet away from the finish line. She staggered a few more steps and crossed the finish line. There were some medics that were there. They put her on a gurney. They're trying to get some fluids. They're trying to take a pulse. And these folks are still trying to get an interview. They've got cameras in her face. they got a microphone. And, uh, and she was just delirious. She said, did I finish? And you know, they're trying to ask questions, and the doctors are trying to help her medically. And she said, did I finish? And again, there was just all this noise going on around her. And about the third time, she said, did I finish? I felt like shouting, somebody tell her she made it. She'll be all right if you just tell her. <laughs> she made it. Friends, we've been through a long race. We've been, we've been serving God a long time. We've been through tests and trials and battles. We've been through temptations. We've been through a pandemic. We've been through hardships. Let me tell you, we're about to cross the finish line. This thing is about to wrap up. And we're not going to quit now. We're going to press on. Somebody shout, get a grip. And stand with me in the house of the Lord if you would please. Come to the music. Somebody, one more time, somebody shout, get a grip. Father, we thank you for the example that Paul leaves to Timothy and that we can read for ourselves. I extend my hand over this congregation tonight, Lord, and I pray that we would not be weary in well-doing, that we would not give up now, that we would not become lax at this time, at this critical time, 
of the church. And Lord, Lord, help us when there is so much opposition around us. May we still have a fire shut up in our bones that we cannot hold back. I'm asking, Lord, that you would help every one of us here to become passionate about the ministry that you have given to us, the task before us. And though many of the people will not come to church, send your church to the people in Walmart or the bank or the post office or the grocery store or the ball field or wherever we go that we can be a light shining in a dark place. That we can be the hand of God extended in a world that needs help and hope. Lord, I pray for those that are running the race not to give up, not to quit. Help us to catch a second wind and to press on. To get a grip of truth to understand biblical doctrine and to live accordingly that our practice and daily life would be in lockstep with our belief in the scriptures. Use us like a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid, like salt and light, making a difference. And Lord, I'm praying specifically that on tomorrow, on Monday, as many return to their jobs, that we would run with the faith and share our faith and pass it down to the next generation. That we would be workmen that would not be ashamed, but know how to rightly handle truth, know how to lead people to Jesus to know how to minister in the Spirit to people who have no hope. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And amen. And amen. There's something I want us to do together in the altar, and I think that we can do this if you'll cooperate with me. With the number of folk that we have here, I think it will work out just fine. I'm going to impose upon you and ask all of you that can and will to leave your seat and stand all across the front. We're going to pray together up around the front. Just start coming right now. And when you get here, we're going to pray. And I want you to see yourself as a runner in this race. Just come stand here with me all across the front. I want you to see yourself as a runner in this race. As though someone had just given you this baton. And now it's your turn to run with it. I mentioned already a couple of times that God called me into the ministry at age 16. I had so many reasons why I didn't think that was a good idea. I never doubted that he was calling. I only doubted that I could fulfill that calling. A few weeks later, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was in my local church, which is in Chester, Virginia, and I walked up to a podium, and I opened my Bible, and I looked up at the congregation and said three words in a dream. Opened the Bible, looked up and said, it's my turn. <laughs> and the dream was over, and I woke up. And I kept thinking, God, I'm too young. I don't have enough education. I don't have the personality. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. But it was as though the baton was given to me and was like, God was saying, no, it's your turn. It's your turn. Run with this. The baton of faith has been handed to you. And it is your turn to run with it. Specifically, here's what I want us to pray about, that God would help us. Most, I'm looking around here. Most of us in here... A little, or a little older. I want us to pray for our younger generation. 
I want us to pray for a younger generation. I do not want it to be said of the next generation what was said in the scriptures that there arose a generation that knew not the Lord or his works in Israel. Our grandparents and great grandparents lived the life and passed it down to us. Now we have a responsibility, not on our watch, not in our lifetime. We want this next generation to know. And we're going to pray that God would help us as an older generation to have influence in the lives of younger people and to pass this faith along. Are you willing to pray a prayer like that with me? Let's do it together right now. Father, we come before you here at this altar and we submit ourselves to you for such a time as this that you would help us as an older generation to reach a younger generation. Lord, we know there's some risk involved in that, but we're willing to take the risk. Lord, even if we don't know how to connect with them on, on their terms, teach us, help us, show us. Let the love of God inside of us be persuasive. Lord, I know that many of the young people are looking for something that satisfies in the world through all kinds of addictions and all kinds of worldly, harmful things. But help us to reach them with truth, with love, with the power of the Holy Spirit and bring transformation. Lord, I pray right now for the moms and dads and the grandparents that stand in front of me that are concerned about their kids and their grandkids. Some of them don't, don't even go to church and don't read their Bible. Some of them that are obstinate to the Word of God. Some perhaps that even don't believe there is a God. But we are praying for change. We are praying, God, that you would shine a light in a dark place. We're praying that you would use us to be an influence on the younger generation and to pass this baton so that truth will carry on. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen and amen. Coming up soon this summer in Roanoke, Virginia, at what we call the campground, there will be youth camps. Youth camps. It's been going on every year for I don't know how many generations now. And I love to hear the reports of these seven, eight-year-old, nine, ten, twelve-year-old teenagers that go to youth camp and are saved, filled with the Spirit, come back on fire for God. God hasn't forsaken the younger generation. God's not leaving them out of His plan. They are a part of today's plan. You agree with that? Amen. Amen and amen. Pastor, just stand beside me here just momentarily. I want to ask this final question. There could be someone standing here that just says, I need a, a prayer uh, tonight. Maybe you need a healing in your body or maybe there's something pressing, a need of some kind in your life. And uh, if you'll raise your hand, either myself or the pastor will come pray with you or some of the other ministers that are here in the house. I just didn't want to leave without giving you a chance. If you need a special prayer, just hold your hand up and identify yourself. We're going to pray for this lady right here in front of me, but there may be others. Hold your hand up if you need a special prayer tonight. I'm looking around. Yeah, there's a hand over here. There's a hand right here. Pastor, would you pray for this gentleman? I'll pray for this lady. And if you want a prayer, and some of you standing close by, would you assist us? Sing it, would you please?
Before you, before you go, can I have your attention? Can we uh, just let the man of God how much we know how much we appreciate him tonight? Can we do that? Amen. Please don't forget on the way out, if you haven't already done this, if you'd like to give and support Cliff's ministry, the gift box is there on that center camera stand. He's got books in the back. Go by and see him. I know you'll be blessed. God bless you.